All right. So. Okay. Oops. So we are going to get started here. Um, so the class is jump starting the growing season. Um, I am Dean Gunderson, I'm the director of education here at Seed St. Louis. Uh, if you've taken one of our classes before, um, either in the last couple months or in the past when we were called Gateway Greening, we're the same people, um, just changed our name. Then uh, this, we're going to run this exactly like um, other classes that we have taught. So because this is a webinar, um, uh, because this is a webinar, um, everyone is automatically muted and your um, videos are, are, like you're not able to turn your video on. Um, and that's just so we don't have accidental noise and whatnot happening um, while we're trying to talk. But um, I do want to hear any questions or anything that you have. Um, if you have a specific question that you are wanting answered by me, um, please put that in the Q and A um, option down there. Uh, not the chat. The chat stuff um, can get buried, um, and so it can be hard for me to find those questions. Um, so if you have a question for me, please put that in the Q and A, um, and those will stay nice and organized for me so that at the end, um, when I check them, um, I'll be able to make sure that everybody's questions get answered. Um, if you have just like general comments um, or information to share with people or things like that, um, feel free to put that in the chat. Um, but if you have a question for me, please put it in the Q and A. So uh, we will get started here. And let's go. Um, like I said, I'll answer the questions at the end, but feel free to drop those in the Q&A as we go so that you don't forget either. Uh, so first, just a real quick rundown of what, uh, what or who um, we are at Seed St. Louis, just in case you're not familiar, if this is maybe your first time um, with us. So we are essentially a support organization um, for community groups who want to produce food. Um, so our purpose, kind of our like, def, like our formal purpose, is to provide the community with the education, resources, and a network to grow their own food. Uh, we currently support a network of about 230 projects across the region. Um, so that is St. Louis City, St. Louis County, um, and then Madison and St. Clair County, which is um, relatively new. It's just been in the last, I think, three years that we've done that. So you can see here on this map, there's not many over in Illinois yet, although we have quite a few more um, coming down the pipeline. Uh, we provide one-on-one -on -one staff consultations, we provide volunteers, we have a tool loan program and access to garden and orchard supplies to those 230 plus network projects that we work with. We also sell low-cost seeds, organic garden and orchard supplies. Um, we contract grows uh, specific vegetable seedlings that we like. Uh, we run a demonstration garden and we teach lots of classes like this one tonight um, that are open to the general public. And uh, we now, starting just this year, we have a backyard gardener program. So if you are not a community gardener, you're a backyard gardener, um, you can keep an eye out for that. It's kind of a, um, a small group of people that we teach, um, like kind of a everything you need to know kind of class course um, that they can do to, um, to be successful in backyard gardening. So uh, we're finishing up the first cohort of that uh, at the end of this month. Um, and so we'll have information out after that of when we will continue that if you're interested. So <clears throat> getting into the topic of the class, um, what are the benefits of an earlier start? Um, a lot of them seem maybe pretty, um, pretty obvious, um, but, uh, you know, allowing an earlier harvest from your garden is a great reason to start earlier, if it makes sense. You know, if stuff starts growing earlier, it's usually going to be ripe earlier, which means you can harvest it earlier. Um, and assuming that's the case, it allows you to eat from your garden for a longer period of time, which can be nice to grow your own um, produce um, for more months out of the year. Another one that maybe uh, not everyone thinks about uh, that's the reason why I like to do it, is that it can allow you to grow some things that might not otherwise do very well here. 
Um, so like in the spring in particular, there's some crops like cauliflower or broccoli that are, that are kind of hard to do successfully in St. Louis because our summers tend to be kind of erratic and not very long, or at least not long enough for what the broccoli and the cauliflower wants a lot of times. And so if you can get them started earlier in the spring or like late winter, then it gives you a longer period before it gets hot in the summer to be able to grow those crops. So you might be more successful growing those things. Or if you're starting warm season crops earlier, you know, things like tomatoes that once you start harvesting, you can keep harvesting until the frost. If you get them started earlier, then you can harvest for a longer period of time. Um, and there's even a few crops that you just basically can't do without starting early, which we'll talk about. They're not, there's not very many of them, but. Uh, but first I'm gonna talk about, you know, uh, mostly we're gonna talk about how to, you know, warm up the soil to start things that you normally think of earlier. Uh, but there's a couple other ways to get started in the garden earlier. Uh, one of the, the best ones, one of my favorite ways is to plant perennial herbs and vegetables. Um, perennials, uh, if you, you know, work with perennial flowers or anything like that, you know that you're, that they're greening, that they're springing up out of the ground, um, you know, much earlier than if you're trying to plant annual flowers, you're going to get something faster because they're already established. You know, they were growing the year before, the roots are still alive and growing in the winter. Um, and then as soon as it gets warm enough, they just spring right out of the ground. And it's the same for herbs and vegetables. So if you have grown those, as long as they're established, um, you're going to get those much earlier. And, and although perennial vegetables are not super common in the American diet, um, the ones that we do know, like asparagus and rhubarb, are primarily like the, the main reason that why they exist as vegetables is because they produce so early. Um, they're producing during a time when you're not really getting anything out of the annual vegetable garden. Um, it's a period of time that traditionally was called the hunger gap. Um, because although we usually think of like, ooh, the real cold of winter is when, you know, people long ago must have starved to death. That's not when they starved to death. They starved in early spring. Um, whenever you ran out of all the stuff you stored over the winter, but there was still nothing coming out of the garden or out of the farm. So it was actually that really early spring period when people were the most hungry. And so perennial vegetables like asparagus and rhubarb uh, were really nice to have, and they can be really nice to have still, even though you can go to the grocery store and get produce whenever you want. If you want to grow it yourself, those are great ones to look for. But there's lots of other perennial vegetables as well. We're not going to go into the specifics of these, um, but they are great to look to look into. Um, so things like uh, walking onions, which is one that we sell um, every fall, starts for, it's really great. It greens up and you can get like a little scallion kind of green onion, just crazy early in the year. Usually I start eating them, usually like the third week of February, um, as long as I had planted them the the fall before like as long as they're established they you know spring up out of the ground really early in the year when it's still cold um things like chives and garlic chives are often thought of you know as herbs but you can use quite a bit of them if you like that oniony flavor um, and they're very productive and they green up really early uh there's a crop called sea kale which is um, popular kind of in the north northwestern coastal part of of europe and the british isles um that uh, produces kind of little broccoli-like florets, um, but also when it first is coming up out of the ground, the, the shoots you can kind of eat kind of like asparagus. It's more leafy than asparagus, but has a, an asparagus-like quality to it. Um, Mitsuba, which is what this picture is here, um, is, is, a, is a Japanese vegetable. Um, it's where it's originally from, it's where it's most popular, but you can grow them here pretty, pretty easily. Um, and they have a flavor a lot like parsley. So again, usually parsley is thought of more as, as an herb, but you can use that, um, use pretty large amounts of it in food, you know, like things like tabbouleh and stuff where you're using like cups of it. Um, you can use it kind of more like a vegetable if you like the flavor. Um, scorzonera is one that is more commonly known as a root vegetable, but it, but it's perennial. Like if you don't harvest the root, the, the greens on top are really good. They're pretty mild. Um, you can use it kind of like a lettuce replacement, but they, you know, are ready to go in the spring much earlier than lettuce would be. Um, sorrel is another green that, um, is good to go really early and horseradish. Um, although you can eat the roots, the greens are also edible. Um, and especially in early spring, uh, the greens are really good and they taste kind of like horseradish. Um, so it's like a 
they're good to add kind of some flavor into early spring salads or things like that. Um, and again, you're going to get them much earlier than you would a spring planted green. Um, so another great way to get um, things started in your garden early um, is, is to have planted them last year. Um, so annual crops, so not a perennial, but there are things that you can plant in the fall and they will overwinter and then be producing in the spring. So obviously that doesn't help you this spring, uh, but it's good to keep in mind for the fall if you want to have an earlier start next spring, spring of 2023, then planting um, crops like this in the fall of, of this year, 2022, is a great way to do that. Um, so there's ones that I call like naturally overwinter. So these are things that you can stick in the ground. They don't need any protection. They will just naturally overwinter without any kind of additional intervention on your part. Um, so those are things like garlic, shallots, um, elephant garlic, potato onions, which is a type of, um, it's a type of bulbing onion, but it, um, instead of producing just one big bulb, it'll produce like a cluster of kind of medium to small size bulbs. So then you can pick them up, stick one back in the ground and eat the rest. Um, uh, walking onions, which we talked about a little bit. Um, there's also things like fava beans, um, which are not super common here in the States. They're more common in, in Europe and the Middle East. Um, but it's a, it's a, it's a bean. Um, you eat it mostly kind of like you would eat like a lima bean, kind of like as a green shelled bean, um, but they're pretty good and they, and they like cool season, unlike most beans. Uh, you can also grow things like winter peas, if you want like soup peas, like dried peas, um, or to have as pea shoots, the, the leafy part of peas is, is also edible. Um, and they're, and they taste just like peas. They're really nice as like in spring salads, um, I really like pea shoots. Um, they're, and pea shoots are pretty popular in, in East Asia. They're not as well known um, in the US, although they have been sold more commonly now as microgreens. Um, but you can also just like grow the plant and just cut the growing tips off um, as it grows. Um, and these are, and sorry, and so I put varieties here because not all fava beans will overwinter. Sweet Loran is the one that I've had the best luck with. Uh, most of the others will die in the winter. Um, for winter peas, I'm sure there's others, but um, Austrian winter pea, Lynx winter pea, and Blaze winter pea have all overwintered well for me. Um, you, can, you can grow lentils if you like, if you want to grow some, some grains, lentils um, will overwinter here as long as you're growing this variety called Morton. Um, and then again, for kind of grains, or if you want to do like wheat grass or things like that, um, winter wheat, winter rye, and winter barley uh, will, also, will also do well here. Um, and this is just a picture of some of the overwintering crops that I grow um, in my garden at home. Um, so there are also plant crops that were bred to overwinter, um, but they tend to be adapted to places that are a little warmer than us. Um, so most of them were developed more for like the Pacific Northwest or the British Isles or like the Netherlands or things like that. Um, so we're just a little bit colder. Usually they do just fine until we get into this period in February that we always get where it gets really cold just for like a week or two. Um, a lot of times I don't cover them until this period where it gets really cold and they do just fine. Um, but you do usually need to protect these in some way to get them all the way through the winter. But these are things that you can plant in the fall. And again, assuming that you, that you do offer them some protection when it gets you know, really cold, um, they will overwinter just fine and allow you to have a really early spring harvest. So these are things like um, sprouting broccoli, winter cauliflower. These three varieties are the ones that I know do well. There's more that I think will do well. Um, we just haven't um, properly trialed them yet. There's things called winter cabbage, uh, most kales, collards, um, winter kohlrabi, Brussels sprouts, turnip greens, spinach, carrots. Um, those will pretty much all overwinter just fine as long as you give them protection if we get an, an unusually cold spell. Um, and, and we have some blog posts up about these, um, like winter cauliflower, winter cabbage, sprouting broccoli, um, which are a little bit less known to people. Um, so you can look those up on our website if you are interested about that, interested in that. Another one that I always like to point out um, that, that I have turned to more and more is uh, what I would call kind of like wild harvested greens. Um, you know, in, in the spring, a lot of what, of what you're growing is greens, you know, it's lettuce and spinach and arugula and um, 
you know, kale and collards and turnip greens and, you know, all these kind of leafy green things. Um, and those are, and those are great things to grow. But uh, I always found myself frustrated in the spring that I was like ripping out all of those spring weeds. There's so many weeds in the spring usually, uh, but I was like ripping all of these out and then planting these seeds. And then the seeds take so long to actually get to a harvestable size. Um, and then I found out that almost all of those weeds that you pull out of the ground in spring are edible. And so I'm like, let's rip out all of these edible greens and throw them in a heap so that I can plant these edible greens that I can't eat for like four weeks. Um, and I just don't like lettuce all that much. And so I just started eating the weeds for the most part. Um, so a lot of those, again, like annual weeds of early spring are edible. And a lot of them were actually brought here on purpose because they're edible and because they grow during this period when people were often looking for food the most. Um, so chickweed is one that is um, that I think is, is really good. It's very mild. Um, a lot of kind of wild greens are really bitter or tart or things like that. Chickweed is very mild. It's got a nice kind of bright, um, juicy crunch to it. And it's incredibly prolific. And it grows really early in spring. Like it, it grows, I mean, it, if you have a warm microclimate, it might just grow all winter long. Like if you have like along your, the foundation on the southern side of your house, you might just have chickweed all winter long. Um, and this is what it looks like. I'm sure you've seen it. Um, if you can't quite tell what that is, Google it. You'll see there's lots of pictures. I'm almost certain you've seen it before. Um, it's a really great one, really mild. You know, it's not, not bitter or anything. Um, wild violets, if you have like the, the violets that like grow in your yard or pop up in the garden sometimes, uh, those are edible. Uh, the leaves are again, really good. They're really mild and bland. Um, kind of chickweed and wild violets are like usually my salad base in early spring because I just just completely stopped planting lettuce um, once I realized that I like those. Um, and the flowers of wild violets are edible as well. Um, I do always like to make the little note that the, the African violet like that is um, sold as an ornamental kind of house plant kind of thing is not actually a violet and that one is very poisonous. So don't eat that one. We're just talking about the wild violets that like grow in yards. Um, in kind of grassy areas. Uh, they're also native, which is, which is a fun fact. Most of these other ones are not native, but wild violets are. Uh, garlic mustard is another one that you might see depending on where you are. Um, and again, you can Google a picture of that. You've probably seen it. Um, and it's got kind of a garlic and mustard taste to it, which is where it got its name. Um, and it, again, usually will germinate and grow in very early spring. Um, and you'll see it in, in your garden quite a bit. Uh, also, if you've seen like wild onion or wild garlic, the greens growing from those are pretty good if you like oniony flavor. And this one isn't necessarily a weed, although some people consider it a weed. You know, you hear people call them ditch lilies and stuff, but day lilies are actually edible. They were originally domesticated as a commercial crop and are still grown as a commercial crop in parts of southern China and Taiwan, um, in the more mountainous areas where it's harder to grow annual crops. Um, the whole, everything about daylilies is edible, like the flowers, the leaves, the roots, everything. Um, in the early spring, the main thing you're gonna be looking for is the, is the, um, the leaves when they're first emerging from the soil, which happens really early. Um, you can just cut those off and, um, and you, can, you can eat them raw or like in stir fries or like wilted, they're really good. Um, a little bit later in the spring uh, when the flower shoots are coming up. You can harvest kind of them when they're tender like this. These are some daylilies that I harvested. And again, just kind of cook those just like you would asparagus and they're, and they're really good. Uh, there's also some less tasty ones that I don't particularly like the flavor of, but they are edible. And I know some people that like them. So those would be things like dead nettle or henbit. Um, and then also, again, we're not, this isn't a foraging class, uh, but there are so many other edibles um, that grow wild in the spring, like so many. Um, it's just most of them are not necessarily in your garden. So things like beech leaves, basswood and linden leaves, cattail shoots, stinging nettles. There's a lot of edible stuff in the spring that's really good um, that you can look into if you have access to more kind of wild or un, um, untended areas. So <clears throat> some things that you can actually, or I guess the the wild ones you can start harvesting, but in terms of planting in your garden, stuff that you can still do this year. Um, so there are some plants that you can just plant really early, um, like earlier than you would plant, you know, broccoli or cabbage or 
spinach or peas. Um, there's not many of them, um, but there are a few. So early March is usually the the kind of the beginning of planting season. If you're if you're you know being careful with what you're doing. Um, but there are things like oats, flax, and bread seed poppy that you want to plant um, as, as soon as you can get into the, into the garden, um, which is usually around March anyways. Uh, but if we have a drier period in February, you can plant them then. It's just as long as the soil is dry enough that you can work it to get those seeds planted, they will grow. Um, they are, they're like just like our winters are just a smidgen too cold for them is really the case. Like most of those crops are grown, being planted in the fall and then overwintering um, in other parts of the world. It's just, we're just a little too cold. So you need to plant them after the coldest part of winter, um, but you can plant them as early as you want. Um, so yeah, um, so flax, you know, you'd be growing for the seeds um, from, from an edible standpoint. Uh, this is a picture of them over here. They get these gorgeous kind of blue flowers on them. Um, bread seed poppy is, is where is like the, like poppy seeds that you, that you eat the seeds from, um, you can grow those and they, they they come in lots of different colors, but the bread seed ones, like this is one, I think this is called Zaire. Um, it's, it's, they're really pretty, but, um, but you can plant them really early, which is nice. Whoops. Um, so, you know, those aren't usually things that you'd be thinking about growing in your garden. So there are a few, um, that you can plant really early. They're a little bit more kind of conventionally considered vegetables, um, but are a little bit lesser known. Um, so fava beans, again, uh, we mentioned those as ones that you could grow over winter as like the sweet Loran, um, but pretty much all the other varieties of fava beans. If you would want to grow those, you would be planting them just as early as possible, um, like when the soil can be worked. So usually sometime in February. Uh, walking onions can be planted uh, this time of year as well. If you didn't plant them last fall, you can plant them now. Um, mosh is one. So it's this is what looks like over here. It's just a little green, like a little greens plant that's very winter hardy. It's originally from Europe. Um, it, it naturally kind of grows a lot like chickweed where it grows just during the coldest parts of winter um, in, in fields like as a weed over in Europe, but they started um, cultivating it, especially in France. Um, and so there's some varieties that you can find that have bigger leaves, you know, tastier, whatnot. Um, Claytonia is another one. Um, Claytonia is also called um, miner's lettuce. Uh, that's one that's native to the, the Western United States, kind of the West Coast. Um, and it looks a lot like um, chickweed when it's young, um, but, as the, but the leaves get much bigger than chickweed on it as it gets older. Um, but that's one that you can plant really cold. And then potato onions is another one that if you didn't plant it in the fall, you can plant it in the spring and still get a pretty good harvest. Um, you can also do the same thing with like garlic and shallots, um, but usually the yields are, are quite a bit reduced on those. So uh, what I imagine most of you were actually wanting to know from this class is like, how do I start my like spinach, lettuce, um, you know, cabbage, kale, all of those things earlier. So that's what we're going to talk about the rest of this time. Um, but I always like to point out those earlier things because I think it's, I think those are really important to think about too, um, to broaden, broaden our scopes. And in a lot of ways, some of those can be a lot easier than what we're going to talk about for these things. So um, to grow that, that, so commonly grown spring crops, um, enable, in order to grow them earlier, essentially what you need is you need to warm the soil. Um, you know, what, what, what prevents you from planting them earlier naturally is just that the soil isn't warm enough. It needs to be warm enough for the seed to trigger germination. Um, you know, those seeds don't want to germinate when it's below freezing because the ground is frozen, which means there's no actual water available and so they can't grow. Um, so generally the, the kind of threshold is the soil needs to be at least kind of 40 degrees to um, for, for plants to feel comfortable enough that they're going to start germinating. So currently, I just looked it up right before this class, our soil temperatures in the St. Louis area are like right around freezing. They're like, you know, a couple inches down. They're like right around freezing, like 29 to 31 degrees, depending at, on where you are in the metro. Um, so, you know, you need to increase that temperature by, you know, like 10, 10-ish 10 degrees to get, you um, those plants to germinate. And that's not that much. I mean, 10 degrees is not, is not a huge increase. You know, we're not talking about, you know, a massive increase in temperature. And there's, and there's several ways to, um, to do that. Um, and that's what you need to do, again, to, to even start talking about what we're going to be planting or anything, is you need to figure out how are you going to heat up that soil. 
So the, the main ways that you can do that is through kind of infrastructure. It's gonna be covering the soil in some way to trap heat in, creating like a little kind of greenhouse type system. Um, so there's things called low tunnels. Uh, there's cold frames, which are, I'm seeing more and more people call those mini greenhouses, but cold frames is their traditional name. Um, but, but those are the same thing, a mini greenhouse and a cold frame, same thing. Um, there's also cloches, which is a, a French word because the French were the ones who pioneered um, the use of cloches um, in, in Paris, the Parisian gardeners are really where a lot of our intensive raised bed um, farming systems came from, um, were these like really intense cultivation around Paris in the, in the 1800s. And then just sheet plastic, just laying on the soil um, can be another way to do it. So, so using these techniques, you can potentially um, and it depends on what the weather looks like, because as you know, our weather is very unpredictable um, this time of year and really all times of year, but especially in kind of the transitions between winter, between seasons tend to be a little, um, it, it, it differs a lot from year to year. Um, but uh, on average, you, you could potentially be planting these spring crops four to six weeks earlier than you would if you didn't if you didn't warm the soil at all, um, which can be really significant. Um, usually because we, because we tend to have these really deep cold spells in February, it's usually on the, on the shorter end of that. Um, it's not super common to get like six full weeks, um, but, but it's theoretically possible. <clears throat> so low tunnels is the first one uh, that we'll talk about here. So low tunnels are essentially like low hoops. So it's like if you've ever you know, seen those like big, long kind of hoop shaped greenhouses, it's the same idea, but short. Um, so it's called low tunnels as opposed to like a high tunnel, which is another word for a hoop house. Um, so it's where you have like low hoops and then you're covering those hoops with either some sort of fabric or plastic that um, to, in order to create like a small greenhouse type environment. Um, so this is just a picture of one here. So for um, the hoops, there's several different options. Um, so you can use like a heavy gauge wire, just like a really kind of thick, stiff wire that you could bend into um, a hoop shape. Or there's also some places that sell pre-bent ones, which I really like just because I'm like really, I like things to be symmetrical. <laughs> and so it's really hard to bend a nice pretty curve. And so I like to buy the ones that are pre-bent, but um, you can also just bend your own, obviously. Uh, you can also use uh, PVC pipe, which is what this picture here shows. And you want just the really, the really thin stuff. It's I think usually like a half inch is the smallest that they do. Um, and half inch is flexible enough that you can bend that and make a hoop out of it. And then, and then you're going to cover those hoops with something. Um, so you can use row cover. So row cover is, um, is like a, it's a fabric type material that looks a lot like a dryer sheet. Um, it's kind of that like spun kind of fibers. They're all kind of matted together to create like a, a fabric, but it's, but it's still pretty translucent. Um, and so that acts just like a little bit of, of an insulation layer kind of. So row cover usually, um, it doesn't heat up the soil quite as fast, but it does help hold the heat in at night a little better. So it's kind of a like, eh, which is, you know, which is better. It kind of depends. Usually row cover is better, um, if you have like a warmer situation, um, then uh, whereas the plastic is better if you like really want to heat it up quickly. So um, if you're going to do plastic, usually if you want to do plastic that has like perforation, if, if you're able to get that, you don't have to, but it makes your life easier um, is if you get a, a plastic with perforation and they sell that. Um, I mean, you could also, I guess, just poke holes in it yourself, but they do sell stuff that already has like perforations in it. And so you put it over that and that helps it, it breathe a little bit, which we'll talk about why that's important. So if you're going to make a low tunnel, um, it's pretty straightforward. You basically just kind of push the hoops into the soil, um, you know, kind of on the either side of the bed, if it's like a raised bed or, you know, wherever it is in the garden that you're wanting to plant stuff. Um, early. So you push those into the soil and then you cover it with either the fabric or the plastic um, that you're going to use to cover it. Um, and when you cut that material to cover the hoops, you want to make sure that it has excess on the, on the sides and the ends um, so that it touches the ground and then there's a little bit more because you need to secure that fabric. You know, if you just throw the fabric over the top, the wind's just going to blow it off. <clears throat> 
So, um, so you want to make sure to cut it so that there's excess. Excuse me. Um, and then you need to secure the fabric in some way. So you can use things that are called like either fabric staples or sod staples. They're just like pieces of wire that look like a giant staple that you can just push through the plastic or the fabric into the soil below it, which will help again, hold it there so that the wind doesn't just blow it off. Um, or you can just weigh it down with rocks, bricks, whatever it is that you have laying around. But you do wanna you know, secure that so that it actually stays, <laughs> stays on and doesn't end up getting blown all over your yard. An important thing uh, with low tunnels, though, especially if you're using plastic, um, row cover, um, because it's not a solid material, because it is kind of like a dryer sheet, um, if it gets really hot, there is a little bit of airflow. So row cover doesn't need this um, as often. But um, the um, uh, sorry. Um, Oops, lost my train of thought. Oh, so row cover will vent it a little bit, but the plastic, because it's because it's solid, um, there's there's nothing, there's no air movement. Um, if you secure it and the plastic doesn't have perforations in it, um, it's going to get really hot, and then there's going to be no air. It's like you know, sit if you sit in your car with all the windows up, it gets really hot, and there's no airflow, so it gets really really hot. Uh, but if you have the windows down, it it doesn't get quite as hot. Um, so although you're wanting to warm the soil, you also don't want to roast your plants. So when we get, um, especially as we get closer to spring, you know, we get some nice bright sunny days. Um, if, if, if your plants are under plastic, it can get really hot in there and actually stress the plants. So it can become important if, if you've already warmed the soil, if you've planted your things and there's like plants in there, that if you have a really sunny day, you might need to, to actually like, you know, open up one of the sides so that there's airflow so it doesn't get too hot. So that's an important thing to think about um, if you're doing low tunnels. And again, it's one of the reasons why um, I like if you're going to do plastic to do plastic that has the vent holes already made, because it, um, you don't need to, to do that manual venting as often. You know, if you have a really, really hot day, it might still be a good idea to open up a side, um, because those holes might just not produce enough airflow. But um, early in the season, when it's still pretty cold outside, um, even if you have a sunny day, those vent holes are going to are going to be enough to to not overheat your plants. <clears throat> so the next um, kind of option, uh, other than low tunnels, so low tunnels tend to be really nice um, if you have a, a large amount of space that you're wanting to, to get planted early. If you've got you know, a big long row that you're wanting to plant early, row covers are nice because it's, it's really easy to just make a big long thing. You just get some more hoops and you cut your fabric a little longer. It's pretty easy. If you're looking at a smaller area, cold frames can be, can be a good option and they, and they tend to look a little nicer or at least they can look a little nicer. They tend to be more permanent structures. Um, there's usually solid walls of some kind and then a translucent top. And so it's the same kind of idea as the as a low tunnel where you're trying to let you know the sun come in, heat the soil, and then kind of trap that heat in there so that it so that it's warming up the soil for you. But there's various ways to do that. So traditionally, kind of the way that you would see it um, historically was usually something like this, where there'd be like a wood kind of box and then you know a translucent top. Um, ideally, the, the top would be slanted a little bit, um, and then you would face that slant to the south because that's where you're going to get the most sun exposure, so it would warm up the most, versus, um, you know, if you slant it to the north, it's not really going to get any sun and it's not going to actually heat up your soil. Um, so you want to make sure to, to angle that to the south, or if it's flat, that, that works too, um, but you don't want to have it angled um, in a direction other than the south, basically. Uh, if you don't want to, you know, build a whole formal thing like this, there's also, I've seen people uh, do this where they'll just like stack like straw bales, but I mean, you could also make walls out of, you know, I don't know, bricks or stone or whatever it is you have, um, and then put translucent material on top. So that can be either rigid plastic or glass. So like old windows um, or old window panes um, is a pretty popular way to do that, or an old door or an old shower door or whatever it is you have. Um, you can just lay that right on top and it'll, it'll help uh, warm up the soil. Um, just like with the low tunnels, you will need to vent these on hot days. Um, cold frames, because, you, because they're more, um, 
they're, they're more enclosed um, and you're not just not row cover. It's not perforated plastic. Like it's a solid sheet of glass or plastic. You do need to make sure to vent those. Um, so you can either do that manually, like in a situation like this, you could just take one of the windows off so that the excess heat will come up. Or if you have, you know, a system like this, there's usually a hinge on the back and you can kind of like prop something in there to like hold it open a little bit um, that will let excess heat come out. Um, they also make these things that are called automatic vent arms that they actually make for greenhouses, but you can attach to a cold frame if it has a hinge on it, which can be really nice, which is just this vent. It's like a little like hinge, hinge arm thing that you would attach to like the glass and the inside. And there's like a little wax cylinder in there that when the temperature gets above, a certain, I think it's like 85 degrees or something like that, the wax will start melting. And as it melts, it expands. And so it pushes on the cylinder and it opens um, the vent arm. And so the hotter it gets, the more, the more of the wax melts, the more it opens. So the hotter it gets, the more it vents. And then as it cools down at night, the wax will resolidify and it will automatically close for you. So those are really nice. Um, to have if you really like cold frames so you don't have to be out there every morning and night kind of opening and closing stuff which can be which can be frustrating <clears throat> and then the uh the last or the the other kind of thing that you would cover thing with is a cloche um so if we're thinking about like how cold frames are sometimes called mini greenhouses the cloche would be like a micro greenhouse uh, it's basically an individual greenhouse for one plant is really what a cloche is so uh, traditional cloches, like the original ones that were used in Paris and then spread to kind of um, to England and the Netherlands and Belgium and stuff like that, um, were made out of were made out of glass because this was like 150 years ago or so. They didn't they didn't have plastic, um, and so they were glass and they tended to be um, these big kind of bell shaped um, glass things, which I believe I believe cloche is French for a bell. Um, if I remember right, I think that's where where the name came from is they look like these big glass bells. They usually have a ball on top so you can kind of pick them up and move them. And you would just stick them over an individual plant like you'd say, like, I want to plant my lettuce earlier. Um, so I'm going to stick it out, you know, when it's still really too cold to do that. And I'm going to stick this this cloche over top of it to keep it to keep it warm. <clears throat> so uh, the they, they also did some out of terracotta, um, which is not something that you would really want to do probably, although we'll talk about the one instance where you might, I think at the very end, I'll mention that. Um, so like glass would usually be the thing that you would use. The, the, um, the limit to, to, the gla to glass or the thing that's annoying, especially as you have one over each individual plant is that they can also overheat. Um, and so if, it, if, it, it's, if it's a really warm day in the morning, you have to go out there and you have to move every single, every single one off the plant. Um, so that they don't overheat and roast your lettuce or you know your spinach or whatever it is that is underneath your little glass cloche. So um, what some people have started doing because it's much cheaper and works a little better is just using old plastic bottles. Um, so like a milk jug works really well or like this. I think this is specifically made for this, but like there's so many different you know little plastic you know berry containers and stuff like that. Um, you can just stick over top, but like a milk jug, you can like cut the bottom off of it. You stick it over your plant. And then, um, once the soil is warmed up and, and we're like having consistent warm days, you can just take the lid off the bottle and then you, and then, the, and then there's a permanent vent and you don't have to go out there and move it on hot days. It's just automatically vented, um, which can be, which can be really, really nice. Um, so the so cloches like a, like I had talked about they work really great for seedlings you know if you're wanting to plant like a whole bunch of you know like like a big block of salad that doesn't really work um, but if you're doing like individual plants like you know broccoli or cabbage or cauliflower that's spaced you know like a foot to 18 inches apart you know where it's not a, a huge amount of of plant that needs to be covered um, these kind of individual cloches can work can work really well for that. Um, so just covering the soil in plastic is another way to get like a really, a really small jump on the season. Um, if, if you're going to do that, you would want to use either a clear plastic or a black plastic um, and just lay it flat over the soil. Something like a white plastic or like a tarp will warm it up a little bit, but, but nowhere near as much as a black or a clear plastic would. Um, but the, you have to remove this before you can plant anything. So if you're, you know, still you know, a month before the beginning 
uh, you know, if you're at the beginning of, of February, you cover this for a week, it warms up the soil, and then you take it off and you plant your stuff, the air temperature is probably still too cold and the soil is just going to cool off. But if you put this on like the week before um, to warm up the soil to give your seedlings like that they germinate faster, that can work really well. So <clears throat> talking about, you know, low tunnels, cold frames, cloches, that like plastic covering, like, like, like what would that actually look like? Like how would this actually work? in terms of, you know, how, how does this actually help me, um, you know, accelerate my season? Um, so important things to know is uh, you want to heat up your soil before you plant. So this is not where you want to plant and then put a low tunnel over it. Um, you want to be, you know, doing, you know, a low tunnel, you know, cold frame, whatever, to heat up the soil to at least 40 degrees. And then once it is at that point, then you're planting your crops. Um, so if you are just like a week or two before the normal planting, you know, so if, if the thing that you're wanting to plant can be planted in mid-March and it's, you know, the beginning of March, then just laying plastic on the soil to, to heat it up, um, can be a good way to like warm the soil up more quickly. And then you take it off and you plant your seedlings and you, or your seeds, and you might not actually be planting them any earlier than normal, but the soil is gonna be warmer than it would be if you hadn't done that. And so they're gonna germinate more quickly. They're gonna be growing faster those first couple of weeks and you'll get just a little bit of a jump start on the season um, in that instance. If you're wanting to do an earlier planting than that, which I'm imagining most of you are wanting, then um, you need to do a covered environment. So that's you know where we're talking about the low tunnels, the the cold frames, and the cloches. So for um, very early planting options, um, you want to put your low tunnel, your cold your cold frame, or your cloche um, over the planting area until the soil is warm enough, and then you're going to plant like like I just talked about. Um, so uh, or you can put plastic. Hmm. Okay. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, you could, uh, yeah. And you could also do this. I don't, I don't know necessarily why you would do this. Maybe like if you, if you don't have the low tunnel materials yet, um, you could like put plastic over the soil um, to warm up the soil. And then once it gets to temperature, you plant your things and then you put the low tunnel over it um, at that point. Um, like if you're, like if you ordered stuff and it's not here yet or something, which, which just happened to me before. Um, so you could do that. Um, if you need to speed up the soil warming even more, like if you want to get started, you know, even faster, if you're like, oh, I put this plastic over the soil or I put a low tunnel up, but it's like been a couple of days and it's still not warming up, you can kind of double up. So if you lay plastic over the soil and then you put a low tunnel over, over top, you've like double layered kind of that plastic um, and, the, and the, the, um, the soil temperature will heat up more quickly. Um, so that's something that you can do to get to that um, to that minimum of 40 degrees more quickly. But then again, you do need to remove that plastic that's over the soil surface so that you can actually plant seeds into the soil. So uh, how do you actually measure the soil warmth? Like you're talking about, you know, making sure you get to that temperature. Um, you just do it with a thermometer. Uh, you wanna, uh, usually the best time to measure is kind of mid to late morning. If you do it kind of in the middle of the afternoon, it's probably gonna be, um, warmer than it would be, you know, in early morning, um, because it's kind of at its peak of the heat that it's absorbing. Early morning is usually where it's like warmed up just a little bit, uh, but it's not full to the, like the, the real high temperature. So you get a little bit more of an average. Um, there are special soil thermometers that you can purchase. They're not, they're not very expensive. So you could do that. This is one here. That's like a manual soil thermometer. Uh, that you just stick into the ground. Uh, they also make lots of digital ones that you can stick into the ground, but you can also use any type of thermometer. There's nothing special about a soil thermometer um, other than it's, it's geared toward the, the temperature range that you would usually see with soil. So like you could use a meat thermometer as long as the meat thermometer goes down to freezing, which, you know, a lot of them don't. Um, but if it's a digital one, it might. Um, you could use, you know, even just like a thermometer for your mouth, as long as the temperature goes down low enough, which again, a lot of them don't. But if you find one that does, there's, there's nothing special about a soil thermometer other than it's, it's made to go down low enough that it's easy to read in the soil. Uh, <clears throat> you want to measure the temperature at about four inches below the soil surface. So, you know, you don't want to just like stick it right on the soil surface. You want to stick it down a couple inches, uh, but you don't need to go real deep. So, you know, just like 
four inches or so is a good is a good depth to do that. Um, and you can just measure that like every couple days um, and see like once you get to your your kind of 40 degrees and then start planting stuff. So then what crops uh, to plant? Um, so really, you know, in the spring, we're talking about any spring crop can be planted as long as, as the soil temperatures reach that point. Um, the hardiest ones are usually the easiest. So things like spinach, turnip greens, arugula, peas, um, lentils and garbanzo beans, although, you know, people don't usually think about those, but those are also really hardy and those can be planted really early. Potatoes, um, those are all really easy to do. Um, onions are a great one to do early um, because the earlier you get onions planted, the larger the bulb can be potentially. Um, and that's a big problem a lot of times around here is that we don't have a long enough um, spring before the day length gets too long. Um, and so the bulbs tend to be pretty small, but if you kind of warm up the soil early, you get your onions planted early, uh, they have more time to get a nice big um, bulb onion on them. Uh, broccoli and cauliflower are also great ones to do, like we talked about earlier, um, because they often don't have a long enough season to do well here. And so if you get them started earlier, um, they're gonna do even better. <clears throat> um, but essentially, but you can also do any other crop. Like you don't need to stick to these hardier ones. You can do cabbage, you can do kale, you can do collards, you can do lettuce, you can do carrots. Uh, these are just ones that are, that are kind of the easiest to do. Uh, and then I also like to point out too that pairing these techniques with seedlings gives you an even earlier head start. So, you know, if you warm up the soil so that you can plant stuff four weeks earlier than you could normally plant it in the garden and you're planting a seedling at that point, you've now gotten like close to two months of a head start on what it would be if you were planting seeds um, at the, you know, at the time that the soil would normally be warm enough. So pairing seedlings with, um, with these kind of soil warming techniques can really, um, can, can really make or break a spring. Like, I mean, you can really get a lot more food or, or potentially have more luck with things that maybe you've struggled with in the past if you're able to do that. Um, and although we're mostly thinking about uh, spring stuff right now, I do also like to point out that these same techniques can be used to get a jump start on warm season crops. Um, it's usually a much smaller benefit you get, um, usually closer to like two weeks, maybe three weeks that you would get for warm season crops, but you can get those warm season crops in earlier if you warm the soil and you would warm the soil in the exact same way that we talked about. Um, warm season crops though need a minimum soil temperature of 60 degrees. So you'd, you know, just the same, you'd be measuring your soil temperatures, but you'd wanna make sure that it's at least 60 degrees. Um, but really ideally you want closer to like 65 to 70 degrees, especially if you're talking about things like tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, um, which is what most people are anxious to get in the ground. Those really want really warm soil temperatures. Um, and I really like to emphasize that because everyone is always super anxious to get their tomatoes in early. Um, and there's really almost no benefit to getting it in early if the soil is not warm enough because tomatoes are from the Amazon rainforest. They do not have the ability to tolerate cold soils. And so if you stick them in earlier, they might not die, but they're also probably not gonna grow. And the reason they're not growing is because tomatoes cannot absorb nutrients from the soil unless the soil is warm enough. The nutrients are literally locked up um, in a way that tomatoes cannot access them because genetically they've never had to because they're from the rainforest. And so uh, if you wanna get your tomatoes in earlier, then like Mother's Day, you really wanna be doing these soil warming techniques if you want them to be growing. Uh, you can plant them earlier, but like I said, they're probably just gonna sit there and not do much of anything. Uh, you'll probably start noticing the leaves turning yellow um, and that's because they're getting nutrient deficiencies because the soil is too cold. Um, so warming the soil can be a great way to get those in the ground earlier if you want them to be in the ground earlier. Uh, so, uh, so tomatoes can be a great way to do that, but some of the things uh, that, that this can be really beneficial for because it can make them significantly more productive are things like tomatillos, which tend to grow for a long time before they start producing. So getting those started early. Um, ground cherries are kind of the same way. You can get a much larger harvest by warming the soil earlier. And then things like ginger and turmeric, um, our seasons are usually too short for those crops to do really well, but if you start them early, and then especially if you also use a low tunnel again in the fall to keep it warm longer, you're gonna get a significantly larger harvest from ginger and turmeric. Um, it's not uncommon to really not get much of a harvest at all from ginger, but if you extend the season, even like 
a month or two, you know, between getting started early and getting started later, you can see like significant, like orders of magnitude increase in yield um, growing ginger and turmeric, if you like those, um, those spices, which I personally love. Um, so just some other kind of random applications of these kind of techniques. Um, you can also use these techniques to make those, those naturally early crops even earlier. So like the things that we talked about um, as, you know, like, um, like perennials that will overwinter and they'll, you know, shoot up out of the ground earlier. Um, you know, if you, if you cover them, they'll shoot up even earlier than they would normally. Um, sea kale is an example of this. So this is like the one instance that terracotta cloches are like a thing and it's a thing in Europe. There's not really a reason for you to do it unless you're like real interested in what this is. But um, terracotta um, covering sea kale in the spring will help um, heat up the soil and it'll emerge from the soil more quickly. It'll, it'll because there's no sun, the sea kale will, will turn white. It'll never turn green. Um, and that's supposed to give it like a totally different flavor. And so in Europe, they do that and they cut the tops and harvest those shoots. Um, and it's a lot like white asparagus. So you could also do the same thing with asparagus. If you know like where your asparagus crown is and you put that over it, it'll, it'll emerge. And since it's covered, um, it'll stay white. That's what white asparagus is. It's just asparagus that's been covered <laughs> in a way that sun can't get to it. Um, so if you really like white asparagus, that's how you do it. Um, so that'd be another way to kind of use these techniques. Um, but these low tunnels, cold frames, and cloches can also be used um, just because they, they heat up the ground. So things that, uh, that you would plant early, so think like we talked about like oats and mosh and um, you know the, the miner's lettuce and things like that. Um, if you set up like a, a cold frame in like January, like early February, um, to warm up the soil, it's, it's going to be easier to plant those early um, because you'll, you'll dry out the soil more quickly um, and you can get into that soil to work it to plant those things earlier. Um, you can also put them over things that overwinter, like I said, like perennials or even like, you know, if you overwintered fava beans, um, if, you, if you cover this, if you cover them like now, um, they'll warm up and they'll start growing earlier than they would if they were just relying on the normal um, environment to warm up the soil and the air temperature. And then you might get a faster harvest, um, you know, even more than if you planted it just in the spring. Uh, and one example of that is, um, is pea shoots. Like I said earlier, I really like pea shoots. So I, I plant peas a lot in the fall and then I kind of harvest them throughout the winter. And then I like to harvest them uh, in the spring as well while I'm waiting for other things to produce. Um, but I did a couple of years ago, like I, I covered like a small section of it in like a little cold frame and like the stuff that wasn't covered was like this big and the stuff that was in the cold frame was like two feet tall. Um, and they were planted at the exact same time. They were growing right next to each other. Um, and so just having that extra heat just made them grow a lot faster. And so I was getting a lot more pea shoots from them, um, earlier in the season, which was nice because then they kind of, they grew faster. I harvested all those and then I ripped them out. And like, by the time that I was doing that, the ones that weren't covered were then like really flourishing. And then I started harvesting all of those. So it was a way for me to kind of stagger my harvest and get, um, and get more total crop that, I, that was actually feasible for me to eat, which was nice. So um, kind of a, a general summary here. Uh, the easiest way to get an early harvest is to plant perennials, is my opinion. Um, because once you get them in the ground, they're really not that much work after that. You're not having to replant them every year. You're not having to cover them. You're not having to do any of that stuff. Um, so those perennials can be a great way to get an early harvest. Um, harvesting edible weeds that grow before your vegetables, things like chickweed um, is another you know, very easy way to do it because you're ripping them out of the ground anyways, just Instead of saying you're weeding, say you're harvesting. Um, you can plant overwintering crops, which will get you an earlier harvest. Um, and if you put heating structures over those overwintering harvests or those overwintering crops in late winter, you will get an even earlier harvest from them um, in the spring. If you plant crops that can be, uh, you can then plant crops that can be planted earlier, just naturally. Like again, the things we talked about like mosh and oats and, and whatnot. Um, and then use heating structures to preheat the soil and create a warmer microclimate um, in order to plant uh, the, the just kind of conventional crops earlier than you would normally be able to do that, um, four to even six weeks earlier. Uh, 
you can then use those exact same structures to preheat um, the soil, allowing you to plant warm season crops two or so weeks earlier. And then uh, if you use transplants, if you're planting transplants, you can get an even, an even bigger head start um, on, your, on your spring growing. So um, yeah, so that is the gist of what we're talking about. Um, I see there's quite a few questions here um, and I'll be happy to answer those. Um, I see there's a lot of chat stuff too that I will look over. Um, but if you put a question in chat, if you wouldn't mind throwing it into the Q&A, that'll help me go through more quickly. Okay, so first question here. Uh, will asparagus spread through the garden or does it stay in one area? Um, so asparagus, it's, it's a, it's a clumper. Um, so it's, um, 